Hi. Okay, so this is our pre-reading lecture for our reading by Clarence Lusain from his book, The Black History of the White House. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of the issues and context around um, the archival research that Lusain did into the construction of the White House. So we'll be talking about slavery, enlightenment, and the symbolism of what is referred to as neoclassicism. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is a bit of background on enlightenment thought and politics. We'll take a look at um, neoclassical painting and architecture and talk about what it means. Um, we'll go into the paintings and architectural examples in greater depth together um, during our Zoom meeting. This is just a bit of background so we have a sense of what um, the material world um, the built environment of this era of Enlightenment thought in the early United States looked like. Okay, so let's talk about the Enlightenment. What is it? Okay, so um, the Enlightenment is an intellectual and political movement um, that's characterized by putting man at the center of the universe instead of, say, God, right? Um, so what we're thinking about here is that these um, intellectuals and political activists in the 18th century are interested in promoting the power of man and if man uses his reason and his rationality then we will move towards a more just society so there's this strong belief in the idea of progress um, that we are moving forward towards a something better towards something more just um, and likewise the conception of the free individual is at the center of the school of thought and it gives rise to these values that probably sound familiar to us of liberty and equality. So the sense that right man is the maker of his own future um, and that um, the tools that man has to make this future are reason and rationality. Okay, so the other thing that is remarkable or noteworthy about this era is that it is marked by this emphasis on categorization and social organization as well. So for example, the encyclopedia is an enlightenment project. The idea that you could write down everything that we know in the world is a very enlightenment um, project that you could put all human knowledge into a book kind of reflects this dedication to this idea of, right, if we use rationality and reason, we can know everything there is to know. Um, on the other end, right, this idea that this era is marked by social organization, um, we begin to see the emergence of this idea of the citizen. So if we think about, um, right, Enlightenment thought's roots are in Western Europe, which was traditionally ruled by kings, queens, lords, and ladies, right, monarchs, as they're referred to, or members of the aristocracy. Um, so this idea of the citizen has nothing to do with that kind of power structure of kings and queens and monarchs, right? So it is anti-aristocratic as we see here. So Enlightenment thinkers are against the monarchy, they're against the lords and the ladies, um, and they are interested in declaring that the rights of man and this idea of the citizen um, is something that someone is born with, right? A natural right, which we'll look at a little bit more closely in a moment. Um, but in order for social categorization or social organization to function, there is a kind of need to create a category of citizen and a category of non-citizen. So to kind of have citizen be a valuable identity to put on, um, this also means you are in the business of declaring who is not a citizen and who doesn't fall under this idea of having um, rights that deserve protection as well. Okay. So the other thing that we see here is that um, Enlightenment thought is structured by this central belief in empiricism, which is something we may have heard in a philosophy class or a science class in the past. So empiricism is the idea that knowledge comes from practical experience. It's the kind of show me, right? I need to see it to believe it. Um, so instead of taking um, a kind of religious or mystical or superstitious worldview um, where you believe in things that you can't see, right, um, whether it's God or whether it's um, something else, right, this kind of idea, empiricism is very much um, about seeing is believing. And as we mentioned earlier, the other kind of central um, thread of enlightenment thought is that man is the maker of his own world. 
So one of the thinkers that is central to this era of enlightenment um, and particularly important for our discussion of the American context is John Locke, who is a British political thinker who um, comes up with this idea of the idea of natural rights that becomes really central to the way that the founding fathers are thinking about um, the values of the early United States. So John Locke states that um, humans are born good and they have a natural right to life, liberty, and property. Um, so those of us who may have grown up Catholic, like myself, um, we have the sense that like you got to be baptized, right, in order to um, become good, as it were. And John Locke's kind of like, no, nope, everybody's born good, and we're all born with these um, rights um, to our own path in life. Um, so when we see him talking about natural rights, he's necessarily defining this idea of natural rights in opposition to the idea of hereditary rights. So the idea of hereditary rights um, relates back to that power structure um, that was going on in Western Europe, the monarchs, right? So why does a king have power? Because his dad was the king. Why does a queen have power? Because her mom was the queen, right? So this idea that power passes through um, inheritance, through hereditary rights, as opposed to everybody being born with an equal um, stake in access to power. So we see Enlightenment thinkers are interested in declaring that they have a right to um, have access to life, liberty, and property, and in particular also to political power. Um, so in this way, Enlightenment thought is both philosophical about the kind of fundamental definitions of man's values, but it's also about um, if man has these rights, then anyone should have access to um, power, not just those that happen to be born inside of an aristocratic family lord and lady so and so as it were okay so um this kind of change in philosophical worldview this change in perspective inspired a lot of political upheaval and we see that in particular in the american front and french revolutions and so these revolutions are framed as struggles for the rights of citizens um so what we see happening here is that the american and french revolutions um, provided benefits to a small subsection of who were French and American citizens, right? So as we'll discuss, um, the idea of citizen is drastically limited by categories of both race and gender during this period. So men who lived in France uh, benefited from the French Revolution, uh, white men in particular, right? Um, so when we're thinking about this, um, this um, worldview is also structured around a narrow definition of who counts as a citizen um, and so whose rights are prioritized, protected, and valued. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay, so we're talking about this kind of problem of equality, right? Um, and we're looking at a painting here by John Trumbull, and this is an example of a history painting. Um, so a history painting, as we'll talk about in a moment, is a painting um, movement that starts in the 17th, uh, excuse me, the 18th and 19th centuries um, that begins to document current events as opposed to mythological events, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, right? So we're looking at all these folks who are sitting down um, to uh, write up the old Declaration of Independence. And if we notice something about this painting, uh, it's a bunch of dudes, that's a bunch of white dudes, right? Um, so when we are thinking about this, this kind of problem of equality or this contradiction around the idea of equality um, is going to be really important for um, our reading by Clarence Lussain as well. So we want to keep these ideas in mind. Um, so if we're thinking about how the idea of natural rights influenced the draft, uh, the, excuse me, the drafting of the Declaration of Independence, this contradiction is also very influential as well, right? So we have the sense, as we're probably familiar with, that um, the Declaration of Independence starts with this kind of statement, if all men are created equal, who counts in this declaration and why? And this kind of gets us back to that idea of like who is conceived of as part of the public, who is conceived of as part of this kind of definition of men. And if we're looking at the painting, we get a couple of clues. And if we know our American history, um, we know um, the ways in which this um, promise of liberty and this promise of equality was only for a group of people who were all the same, right? So one of the things that we'll explore a little bit um, together in class um, when we get together um, for our Zoom meeting is that we are thinking about the idea of equality in the Enlightenment really only works if everybody is the same. As soon as you introduce either racial or gender difference, there is 
no longer equality, right? Um, no longer are these folks um, promised these same um, values of liberty and equality as well. So we'll get into a deeper discussion of that as we um, get into the specifics of our reading um, for this week. Okay, so what we're going to do quickly here is just take a look at, so we have a sense of the visual world of um, these uh, of these thinkers, right? So um, Enlightenment thinkers also invented new architectural and painterly styles to reflect their new world view. And so what we're going to do is kind of see, so what did these folks surround themselves with and what does it tell us about how folks that align themselves with the French Revolution, with the American Revolution, and with Enlightenment thought, how did they see themselves? What does the architecture, the monuments, um, and the paintings that they surrounded themselves tell us about how they saw themselves? Okay, and as we'll talk about in class um, when we get together at our Zoom meeting, we'll think about, right, all these buildings and all these paintings are still around, so what do they mean now? What do they reflect in our contemporary cultural context? Okay, so we're talking about two movements um, in art and architecture during this Age of Enlightenment. We're talking about neoclassicism and we're talking about history painting. So neoclassicism is a revival style, which means it's kind of a throwback style. Um, that is playing with and um, reviving a set of historical references. And then history painting, um, which I mentioned a moment ago, is um, paintings that depict current events in a very grand and dramatic style. Okay, so um, neoclassicism simply means new classicism. Um, and the classic in classicism refers to Greek and Roman sources. So that's the style that's being revived with neoclassicism, and we see it in architecture, painting, and sculpture. Um, so this is just to give us a sense of the visual style. We'll do a full analysis of this painting together in class um, during our Zoom meeting, but I just wanted to put it up here for our reference. Okay, what about history painting? We see painters start to observe the world around them, um, and kind of speculate on what contemporary events might be super important in the future, right? If you're going to spend months and months and months making a giant painting, you better think that the event that you're depicting is super important, right? Um, so this is a great example of a history painting that we'll examine in greater depth um, as we get together during our Zoom meeting as well by Benjamin West, um, The Death of General Wolf. Okay, so finally, what we're reading about in our chat is neoclassical architecture. So this is a style that becomes popular in the early United States for lots of different kind of contexts, right? So for civic projects, aka government buildings, museums, and private estates. So the structures are um, trying to emanate, trying to communicate a lot of different messages, right? Messages of nationalism and national pride, messages of individual enlightenment um, to create a temple of culture, right? A lot of museums are made in the neoclassical style. Um, and it forms the core of how, right, this very kind of young United States develops its new capital at Washington, D.C., which is what we're going to be reading about in our chapter. And so we've all seen this architecture. We know what it looks like, um, but let's just take a look at it. Um, so we have this imagery in mind as we get into um, our reading for the week as well. So this is an elevation, right, which is an architectural rendering for the Capitol building. Um, and we will get into, right, why not just build a log cabin to have Congress in, right? Why build a Capitol building? We'll get into that kind of discussion um, as we get together um, in class for our Zoom meeting. Um, this is a drawing for the White House, which we will spend some time thinking about as well. And as our chapter gets into, all of these buildings are essentially right, a backdrop for these kinds of um, contradictions that we see in this kind of um, Enlightenment definition of equality, right? That Washington, D.C. itself um, was um, a city that was marked by the slave trade at the same time that they were espousing um, this commitment to um, this new doctrine of equality. So that's it. Enjoy the reading, and I will see everybody in our Zoom meeting. And let me know if you have any questions um, via Canvas message. Thank you all. I look forward to talking more. Okay.